The committee will come to order. I'm going to ask all the members to take their seats. And pursuant to notice, we meet today to mark up House uh, H.R. 2548, the Electrify Africa Act. And without objection, all members may have five legislative days to submit statements for the record or any extraneous materials for today's bill. So I'll now call up H.R. 2548. Without objection, the bill is considered read. The Royce Engel Amendment in the nature of a substitute that was provided to your offices Tuesday morning is considered based text for purposes of the markup and is open for amendment at any point. And after my brief remarks, I will recognize the ranking member, Mr. Engel from New York, and then any other member seeking recognition to speak on today's bill. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, when we when we flip a light switch in this country, when we power up a computer or swipe a credit card, we take for granted that the electricity that we're going to need to do that function is going to be there. But imagine for a moment if our shops or our schools or our hospitals and our homes had absolutely no electricity. What would happen if you flipped that switch and nothing happened? Even the most industrious manufacturer would be very hard pressed to stay in business. The most dedicated surgeon would be powerless in a hospital to save lives. And unfortunately, this is the reality throughout mo most of Sub Saharan Africa. Seventy percent of Africans lack access to dependable electricity. The Electrify Africa Act is a response to this massive power shortage. It offers a market-based strategic framework to bring affordable energy that is reliable to the 600 million people in sub-Saharan Africa who currently have none. Why do we care? We care because jobs are at stake, also human lives are at stake. Now, over all of Africa, the population is now about a billion. We have one billion consumers. The African continent has great economic potential. Last year, a bipartisan committee of staff delega of a delegation here traveled to three countries, to Ghana, to Liberia, and Nigeria, to see how these countries could make better use of the African Growth and Opportunity Act. I can tell you I and Greg Meeks have traveled in the past to these countries to see what could be done to create more economic growth. And we passed landmark legis legislation a decade ago in order to try to increase trade, create, increase opportunity, um, remove the barriers for exports from these countries to the U.S. But in all three of these countries, the production of goods for export was rendered nearly impossible by a lack of affordable energy. Even where other countries and uh, in the region were doing well and where conditions were ripe for manufacturing, the problem is that the cost of running a plant on a diesel generator is simply prohibitive. Not to mention the absence of electronic devices and Internet access, now so critical to businesses and now very critical to education. This lack of electricity even has a direct impact on our nation's spending. For example, the U.S. Embassy in Liberia spends, how much do you think they spend on their diesel generator there? $10,000 a day. That is why it is so impractical to think that small businesses are going to be set up to run and then have to rely on diesel generators. There is no usable grid in Liberia right now. When I chaired the, Af the uh, Africa subcommittee, I saw firsthand how a lack of electricity stifles development. Women spend long days searching for wood or searching for charcoal to provide heat for their families. Children study with light from highly flammable kerosene lamps. And health risks are very high as a result. Cold storage of vaccines 
is almost impossible in this kind of a situation. Families res resort to using inefficient and highly polluting sources of fuel, and you can imagine what happens when the toxic fumes from those fuels waft through their homes. As a matter of fact, that causes more deaths in the region than HIV, AIDS, and malaria combined. Many of this committee have spent years working to help transition African countries away from assistance into economic growth. The Electrify Africa Act mandates a clear and comprehensive U.S. policy so that the private sector can proceed with the certainty it needs to generate electricity in Africa, at no cost, by the way, to the U.S. taxpayer. We need to be engaged. Where the United States has left a void for economic investment in Africa, China, of course, steps in. China has directed $2 billion towards energy projects on the continent. If the United States wishes to tap into this potential consumer base, we must act now. It's another point I would make for the members. And I want to thank Ranking Member Elliot Engel and Africa Subcommittee Chair Chris Smith and Ranking Member Karen Bass in particular for helping craft this bill, which comes at a crucial moment in time. And I want to also recognize the wide range of support for the bill from the 35 African ambassadors who have sent letters of support to us here on Capitol Hill, to the private sector groups like Chamber of Commerce and the Corporate Council of, Afri uh, of Africa, and advocacy groups like the One Campaign, and I would just like to ask those members of the One Campaign who are with us if they would just stand for a moment to be recognized as well. Thank you very much uh, for your engagement on this issue and uh, the assistance in, in trying to electrify Africa. And at the end of the day, I know the committee wants to see communities in sub-Saharan Africa flourish. This bill sets out a comprehensive, sustainable, market-based plan to bring hundreds of millions of Africans uh, into the global economy. And I'll now turn to our ranking member, Mr. Eng Elliot Engel of New York, for his opening statement. Mr. Chairman, thank you uh, for holding this markup of the Electrify Africa Act. Uh, I am very pleased and honored to be the lead Democratic co-sponsor of this bipartisan legislation, which addresses a critically important issue. And let me say, do you ever see so many uh, good-looking young people who stood up? I want to thank them for everything uh, that they are doing as well. Um, it really uh, makes me feel good when there are young people who are so involved. Um, we have great hope. Uh, for this country and for the, the future of the planet with, with young people uh, being so heavily involved. Mr. Chairman, Sub-Saharan Africa is one of the most energy deficient regions of the world, with nearly 70 percent of the population, which is more than half a billion people, lacking access to electricity. In some countries, that figure is even higher. In DRC, 85 percent of the population has no power. Kenya, 82 percent, Uganda, 92 percent. And those are really staggering statistics. The lack of reliable electricity has many negative consequences. In desperation, people burn anything they can find for heat and cooking, wood, plastic, trash, and other toxic materials. These dirtier fuels cause greater harm to people's health and to the environment. Rural populations living off the grid require kerosene and cooking fuel to be transported from larger cities, making essential commodities cost more for those who are already struggling to survive. Many businesses have had a hard time succeeding because they are forced to pour expensive diesel fuel into generators day and night or deal with constant power outages from unreliable electrical grids. Hospitals cannot provide adequate services because they are unable to provide consistent cold storage, light or power for life-saving devices, and the list goes on and on. This bill begins to tackle these challenges in a comprehensive way. It directs the executive branch to develop a strategy to increase electrification in Africa and to employ U.S. assistance programs to help accomplish that goal. This long-term strategy will focus not only on building more power plants, but also on increasing African government accountability and transparency 
improving regular environments, I'm sorry, improving regulatory environments and increasing access to electricity in rural and poor communities through small renewable energy projects. Only by addressing all of these challenges together will people in Africa finally have access to electricity that will allow them to grow their economies and ultimately reduce their reliance on foreign aid. Mr. Chairman, I know that you know Sub-Saharan Africa is filled with dynamic individuals trying to make their countries better, and I believe this bill supports their entrepreneurial spirit. Mr. Chairman, our staffs have worked together in a bipartisan fashion, which I am pleased to say has been the way we have run this committee. It has been a pleasure. We drafted this bill and refined it with the substitute now before us, and we did it together. So, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate your deep commitment to the people of Sub-Saharan Africa, and I look forward to working with you to move this bill forward, and I yield back. Th thank you, Mr. Engel, very much, and thank you for your assistance also in drafting the legislation. Um, we will go now to any members seeking to speak. Uh, we will go first to Mr. Chris Smith. Thank you very New <clears throat> much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for, and Elliot Engel, for crafting this excellent bill, Electrify Africa Act. You know, Congress's interest in Africa is not only longstanding and robust, but it's often varied. At times, the focus is on peace and development, the mitigation of war. Sometimes there's more of an interest on trade. Uh, others, obviously, and all of us, I think, uh, play a role on all of this. Uh, we believe education is the key to Africa's future success, and of course, humanitarian issues and, and the fight and the combating of things like uh, malaria, HIV, AIDS, and, and uh, TB are very, very high on the agenda. But, you know, all of this and all of the progress is, is held back by the lack of electricity. And this legislation uh, isn't a grant. It's not a, a brand new set of, um, of, of foreign aid initiatives. It, is, it calls for very serious cooperation and a strategy to electrify Africa, to use many of the the advances we have made over the last several years uh, with regards to electricity, best practices, of course, doing it in an environmentally sane and safe way, uh, to say, let's share that with Africa, let's do it as partners. This legislation, I think, is, is an idea whose time has come, and I thank the Chairman for sponsoring it. Thank you, Mr. Smith. We now go to Karen Bass of California. Um, thank you, Chairman Rice and Ranking Member Engel, for your hard work on this. And I'd like to associate myself with the comments of the Ranking Member uh, Engel in terms of um, congratulating the Chair on how the committee is run and the bipartisan way in which we have done legislation. With greater access to electricity, Africa has the capacity to grow its economies, facilitating greater volumes of intra regional, transcontinental, and international trade. Greater access to electricity also enables countries to expand human capacity and address the critical challenges of underemployment. Access to additional power will also help both individual countries and geographic regions address infrastructure challenges, all of which contribute to increasing the capacity of African nations and the continent as a whole. Greater access to electricity improves the quality of life for not only urban but rural communities. In the absence of electricity, the ability to work, to run a household, or to do homework after dark is truly a challenging feat, especially in rural areas. Many of you may have heard the in inspiring story of the young Kenyan engineering student, Mr. Evans Wadongo, one of CNN's top heroes of 2010, who at the age of 19 literally transformed the lives of people in his village by developing a solar lamp. Asked why he spent so much time and money attempting to produce the lamp, Mr. Wodango said he did so to improve the lives of people like himself and to ensure that no other student had to go through what he had to go through just to study. Mr. Wodango's eyesight is permanently damaged due to prolonged use of kerosene lamps and the irritation of his eyes from kerosene fumes. Reportedly, Mr. Wodango hopes to produce some 100,000 solar lamps by 2015. His story underscores the importance of balanced access to electrical power and the need to ensure that power is not simply directed to the economic sectors, but also to the rural and low-income communities where many bright students like Mr. Wodongo lives. Um, I think for, for all of us, it's very hard to imagine what it would be like to go through a day without electricity. I often think of the health challenges that that presents 
and the number of women on the continent who have to deliver children in the dark. Um, I, in closing, I want to acknowledge the concerns raised by a number of organizations and express my appreciation to your staff, Mr. Chairman, for meeting with all of the advocacy groups and taking their concerns into consideration. I understand that their concerns are that renewables be included, that access to electricity be for the general population, and that we make sure the governance of the infrastructure is transparent. I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you, Congresswoman Bass. We will now go to uh, Congressman Duncan of South Carolina. I want to thank the Chairman. Um, you know, this is a, a, an interesting bill to me, uh, uh, being a pro-energy guy and thinking about uh, improving the quality of lives for folks all around the globe, um, specifically in Africa today, but we can incorporate most third world countries. And uh, how do we improve the lives of folks that are using uh, charcoal to cook with or wood uh, or coal to heat their homes. Uh, electricity does that. Uh, electricity provides uh, a way to keep uh, food uh, for, uh, from spoiling for a long time. Electricity provides uh, an ability for third world parents to educate their children and, and help them read after the sun goes down. It provides the warmth, air quality uh, improvement. If you are cooking and, and heating with um, with combustible uh, products like coal or charcoal or, or wood, uh, air quality is not as good. So uh, I am supportive of this effort, but I want to mention to the committee one thing that, that I would hope the administration uh, in embracing this bill um, would consider, and that is small modular reactors, which is uh, a new technology, but uh, new to this day, but not new to the nuclear industry. It has been around a long time. Small modular reactors can uh, power uh, small cities, large neighborhoods, and, uh, and in this case in Africa, small villages with a very stable 24-7 baseload power supply uh, to meet the needs of, of the uh, electrical components there. And if you think about, uh, and, and I think about the African villages, but also the, the, um, the manufacturing processes that could come in to provide uh, incomes and stability, uh, I think about uh, the, the moms and dads having fresh food in their refrigerators and cooking over electrical stoves and that sort of thing. So um, there's a lot of things to think about when we think about electricity in, uh, in third world countries, and that's transmission lines and, and uh, security and other things, especially with regard to, to small modular reactors that I, I know others that, that may not like nuclear power will raise the concern about proliferation of nuclear materials, but uh, there are ways that can uh, be used uh, in that area. So uh, I would hope that the administration would look at small modular reactors as a uh, viable uh, source. And uh, it's not all just hydropower. There are other ways that we can meet the needs. I think this is the right thing to try to, to uh, support electrifying Africa and, and all the third world to bring them uh, up in their standard of living and quality of life. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back. Uh, thank you. Uh, we go now to Mr. Meeks of New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, first, I want to join uh, Mr. Engel and Ms. Bass in congratulating you. Uh, this is not new for you. You have been working to make sure that uh, Africa receives the kind of investments and in infrastructure uh, from the time that you were the chair of the subcommittee on Africa. Uh, and you have conducted yourself here in a manner to make sure that that has become a reality. And so I want to thank you for your hard work and your diligence on this particular bill. I want to thank Ranking Member Engel, uh, who has consistently and constantly uh, been working very hard to work in a bipartisan manner and making sure that there's contributions uh, to you and the way he listens and talks to members on our side of the aisle on this committee. Uh, that makes this happen and that makes these things work. So I want to thank uh, Mr. Eagle and Mr. Smith, uh, who's always on humanitarian causes and uh, works hard and doing what he has to do uh, in, um, in regards to this bill. Uh, I want to thank you because it's a joint effort. And of course, my friend and colleague, uh, Karen Bass, who, you know, I think of two things. Number one, I also think of my good friend who is looking down from heaven, Donald Payne, who has worked so hard and so tremendously for a long period of time on working on Africa and trying to see this happen. And then the baton being passed to Karen Bass, who in her vision uh, says that we are going to continue to work and she was going to work just as hard as Donald did. And she, that's, every time I look up, there is something in my hand about Africa that Karen is producing to make sure that Africa is on the thoughts and the minds and the hearts of everybody. So I want to thank you. And of course, I want to thank Mr. Bono and the One Campaign, who, who decided to utilize his celebrity 
to make sure it becomes on the lips of a lot of individuals. You know, sometimes if you don't have a celebrity, uh, what's going on in other parts of the world, no one knows about. But the one campaign and Mr. Bono decided that they were going to stay focused on this and bring the attention to the world. And that then also gives us the motivation on the committee to make sure that we get something and we do something right. And I think that's what we're doing here today. So I want to thank them. Uh, I'm so excited to see that the committee take this uh, proactive action to increase U.S. engagement and investment in Africa. Uh, you know, years ago, when one would discuss Africa, often we only heard it characterized as the poorest continent on the planet. That's no longer the case. More often you hear about flourishing economic progress today. Six out of the top ten fastest growing economies in the world are in sub-Saharan Africa. Over the past decade, there has been a six-fold increase in U.S. foreign direct investment in sub-Saharan Africa to three, 39,000, 39, ,000, 39 $0.5 billion. In June 30th, in a 2013 speech in Cape Town, South Africa, President Barack Obama remarked, there is a historic shift taking place from poverty to growing nascent middle class. After Africa has a great story to tell, but more needs to be done for Africa to reach its full potential. Investments in key infrastructure, such as reliable energy, are vital to continuing African growth and development. President Obama's Power Africa initiative capitalizes on the progress by leveraging international support, the private sector, and regional cooperation to, dra to dramatically increase electricity across Africa. The Electrify Act, uh, Africa Act will solidify ambitious goals for low-cost, clean energy on the continent, including 20,000 megawatts of electrical power by 2020. You know, I've hosted various seminars and trade events to encourage trade in, uh, and investment in Africa. The Electrify Africa Act of 2014 will bring the kind of confidence to investors that Africa has the capacity to support long-term economic growth and is a stable partner for private corporations, NGOs, international organizations, and entrepreneurs. Through this bill, more effective investments in the electricity sector will further enhance Africa's trade capacity, and it will give children the ability to learn hospitals, the opportunity to heal, families, the, the, the opportunity to come together, create jobs and opportunities for those who had been none. I look forward to working with my colleagues on this committee to ensure Africa's future continues to be as bright as the sun. Thank you, and I yield back. Uh, thank you very much. We go now to Mr. Mo Brooks of Alabama. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I very much appreciate the altruistic motivations that I have heard in support of this legislation. Uh, but quite frankly, I don't believe America's financial condition is such that it supports spending this money that we don't have on these projects. The realities of America's financial condition, quite frankly, are rather dire. Over the past five years, we have averaged trillion-dollar deficits every single year. That has been our average. To put that into a different perspective, I would ask the members and the audience to think in terms of their own personal finances. How long could each of us stay out of bankruptcy if year after year after year for five consecutive years, 30 percent of our operational costs, what we spent to live on, was borrowed money? Yet that is the financial condition of the United States of America over the past five years. We have economic history that we can look at that tells us what the dire consequences are going to be if we continue on this path. You can look at Detroit and Stockton, major cities in the United States of America. They are in bankruptcy because of this tendency to spend money that you don't have, which politicians are also apt to do. Uh, now, in Detroit, they are battling in bankruptcy over whether retirees of the City of Detroit are going to receive the pensions that they earn during their lifetimes and that they now need during their elderly years. We can look at Spain and Greece, again, a couple of governments who have not had financial constraint and who have been spending money that they do not have. Their unemployment rate right now exceeds 25 percent in both of those nations. Now think of that about that for a moment. Those are unemployment rates because of financial irresponsibility that are worse than at any point in time during America's Great Depression of the 1930s. You can look at Argentina and Venezuela if you want more examples of the consequences of the path that we are on. Uh, it, where in one month 
their currency was devalued anywhere from 17, 18 percent on the low side to roughly 50 percent on the high side in one month. Uh, of course, you are going to have economic adverse consequences from that. Or you can look at Puerto Rico, a part of the United States, which just two weeks ago Fitch downgraded their sovereign debt to junk bond status. Puerto Rico is going to be suffering for years, if not decades, because of the financial irresponsibility of their leadership, where they didn't properly prioritize and where they didn't say no to good things, not because they don't want to do those good things, but because they don't have the money with which to do those good things. Um, let's be clear then. Every penny that is spent by America on building power plants and power lines in Africa is borrowed. It is money we do not have and money we do not have the ability to pay back. Uh, that having been said, there is some issue about whether uh, this bill is going to cost American taxpayers money. Uh, I would direct everyone to uh, Section 6 of the bill, which is page 11, where we are going to be guaranteeing loans. Quote, USAID should identify and prioritize loan guarantees to local sub-Saharan African financial institutions. That is money that the United States of America is on the hook for. If you go to the very next paragraph, it is talking about partnerships and grants. Again, taxpayer money that would have to be spent. If you want to look at Section 8 on page 13, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, uh, which, by the way, we appropriated $55 million for in FY 2012, and the President is asking for $72 million in 2014 uh, in his uh, budget proposal. That also is going to be assisting with investments that, in turn, cost money, ultimately, that may be American taxpayer money. And before I go any further, let me emphasize, USAID does not come cheap. We are talking $17 billion in FY 2014, $17 billion. That is how much that is costing American taxpayers. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to go to uh, Section 9, Director of Trade and Development, uh, page 17 again, um, this one is talking about, if you will bear with me while I get to that page, the Director of Trade and Development Agency should promote United States private sector participation in energy sector development. Okay? That is administration. That is going to cost money for us to do that. Seek opportunities to fund project preparation activities, including power generation. Uh, there is a whole slew of things that are going to cost, but the bottom line is this. There is no way that anyone can say that this is not going to cost American taxpayers money. It is money that we don't have. You can make the argument that the money is going to be spent anyways and that we ought to spend it on this program, which is a separate argument. But I would submit in response that once you lock this legislation in, it is going to be very difficult to cut the funding to conform to the financial circumstances that we face as a nation. So while I admire the altruism that is expressed so far, I regret that because of our nation's financial condition, I cannot support spending American taxpayer dollars on power lines and power plants in Africa. To recognize myself, um, of course, what this bill is about is giving the private sector in the United States the certainty it needs to go in and create in Africa products that are American-made products that create American jobs over the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. And if we go through the scoring of the CBO, this, in fact, is a proposal that not only does not cost, this is one of the few proposals that we are going to pass that actually is scored to bring revenues into the Federal coffers here in the United States. Why is that so? Because when, you're, when you give American companies the, the certainty that they can go in and invest, they do so, they create the synergy of the new jobs and uh, the new economic relationship. And to put this in context, this is something of a race in Africa between uh, the private sector, the U.S. going in and investing, and China going in and investing uh, in a very different way. When the U.S. goes in, we have a certain template that we uh, are attempting to sell here, market economy, an open economy, not sole sourcing uh, uh, products, but uh, opening up to the international market. The rule of law becomes part of this because 
over AGOA. This is part of the thesis of what we do when we engage with African states, recognizing the rule of law, recognizing an independent court system, and now providing um, energy, uninterrupted energy, in order to be able to entice additional U.S. investment in the subcontinent. Uh, so at the end of the day, when we look at the CBO report, and it shows a return of tens of millions of dollars on these projects, I would argue that this is a very wise investment uh, for the United States to make. And I know uh, Mr. Sherman seeks uh, recognition from California. Thank you. I want to associate myself with the Chairman's opening statement and just about everything else that has been said there in response to the gentleman from Alabama, as the Chairman points out. This bill has no additional cost. We have an obligation to spend our uh, foreign development dollars as effectively as possible. And I am proud to co be one of many co-sponsors of this bill because this bill will help us be more efficient. Uh, it involves using existing loan guarantee authority, encouraging the World Bank and the African Development Bank to use, it, to use their dollars to focus on electricity. And as to the Overseas Private Investment Corporation, we have had hearings in our subcommittee on this. Uh, as a technical matter, $72 million is appropriated this year, or will be if the, under the President's request, but that is a bookkeeping entry. Over the years, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation has returned more money to the Treasury than it has received. And I am confident that, uh, uh, that the guarantee fees that it will charge to guarantee uh, uh, debt to finance projects to electrify Africa will again be part of uh, their uh, success in earning a profit for the United States Treasury. So uh, even if one is not an enthusiastic supporter of foreign aid, I happen to be, but not everyone is, uh, this, uh, this bill represents a small, uh, the, uh, the, the, the very efficient use of a small amount of money that would be spent anyway. Uh, to do something that is important for Africa, as well illustrated in the comments here, and also very important uh, for uh, American global trade. I yield back. Yeah, if the gentleman yields back, and I would point out that what we are actually talking about here is a template. You know, for some time now, the, this country has been moving away from aid, the U.S. has been moving away from aid to trade with Africa. But to but to now say that we are going to move away from trade and investment in Africa with respect to the, the OPIC uh, uh, template, which again is giving U.S. firms the security they need to go in, they are paying fees. And I, I just want the members to understand this. The fees that the companies pay to go in in order to make these investments is what covers the cost. And the structure of that fee system is such that according to the Congressional Budget Office, th there is a return on investment. In other words, there is net revenues flowing in going forward to the U.S. Treasury uh, when, um, when contrasted with the expenditures. It is a net revenue uh, of tens of, of millions of dollars. So uh, with that said, let me uh, recognize who is next in the queue, and, and uh, that is Mr. Jerry Connolly of Virginia. I thank uh, the Chairman, and I associate myself with his remarks. I also thank our colleague from Alabama, Mr. Brooks, for giving voice to the alternative view of the United States' role in the world. What he basically said was uh, the goals contained in the markup today and the legislation today in the markup are altruistic and worthy um, in that regard, but we can't afford them. This zero-sum game view of the United States' role in the world, I would argue, is very dangerous. It is a false choice to tell the American people we cannot continue to afford to be engaged in the world. And even when things are financed, self-financed, we still can't afford them in that 
point of view. In fact, we need to retreat. I find it ironic that rural electri or electrification in Africa, for example, is referred to as an altruistic endeavor. Indeed, Mr. Brooks's own home state of Alabama was a prime beneficiary of rural electrification during the New Deal. And I am sure his constituents are grateful that a different administration at a time of far greater economic stress than today made that investment in his citizens, in his state, in his economy. And the return on that investment has been profound. We, when we talk a zero-sum game about the United States retreating from the world, we give up on the idea that an investment can have a return on it. When the United States makes an investment in other people, in other places, it is not only altruism, I would say to my colleague, it is also enlightened self-interest. Because the return in terms of economic activity, in terms of trade, in terms of investment both ways, is going to be considerable. It is a minor investment relative to the return we are going to see in 20 or 30 years' time. It is not just altruism. It is also enlightened self-interest. And in fact, I would argue, it is about our own future and our children's future. Because as the Chairman indicated, if we don't do it, there are others more than willing to make those investments because they do see the return, the Chinese chief among them. And I don't want to be the person who has to answer the next generation, why is the Africa-Chinese trade the dominant trade in that part of the world and we don't even have a slice of it? And the answer is because somebody somewhere 20 years before said, because we can't afford it. It is a false choice, and I hope this committee will reject that choice, though I commend my colleague for making it quite clear what that choice is. With that, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. We now go to Mr. Ted Yoho of Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And um, my sentiments were similar to Mr. Brooks's in the beginning, but as I studied this, when you see OPEC, OPEC is a self-sustaining basis at no net cost to the American taxpayers. It's generated net profits of $272 million uh, in fiscal year 2012, which has helped reduce the Federal budget deficit for the 35, 35th consecutive year in a row. And to date, OPEC has supported nearly $200 billion of investment in more than 4,000 projects around the world, and it's generated $75 billion in U.S. exports and supported more than 277,000 American jobs. And I've been looking for a way, and I know this committee has, and I, I do commend you for the leadership you've had and the bipartisan support we've had on this committee of a way to uh, have a paradigm shift in our, our, our foreign aid. And if this is a way that we can uh, invest, and not give aid to corrupt governments, but invest, and it generates money to the American taxpayers, uh, I'm in support of it. And I yield back. Thank you. Do any other members uh, seek revenue? Oh, yes, Mr. Cicilline. Sorry, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, would uh, like to begin by recognizing and thanking you and Ranking Member Engel for the bipartisan way in which you approach this important issue and for continuing to educate members of this committee and the general public on the importance of supporting the energy sector in Africa. I would also like to acknowledge the contributions of our subcommittee chair, <coughs> Congressman Smith, and the passionate and uh, determined and relentless advocacy and leadership of our ranking member, Karen Bass, who has been such a strong advocate uh, not only for this piece of legislation, but for so many issues important to Africa. In sub-Saharan Africa, almost 600 million people do not have access to electricity. This, of course, presents challenges not only to quality of life, but also health, educational opportunities, and safety. In particular, women and girls are at greater risk of physical violence without street lamps and phones. And many children are not able to attend school because they are needed to complete tasks at home. And those who are lucky enough to go to school often can't study in the evenings after the sun goes down. And the health uh, outcomes and wellness are compromised, as many have mentioned, without electricity. In addition to the obvious impact on quality of life, uh, in, it is also critical that energy be provided if the full potential of Africa is to be realized. According to the African Development Bank, Africa's economy is growing faster than that of any other continent. 
At the same time, in 2012, USAID assistance to 42 African countries totaled $8.1 billion. We cannot expect African countries to be able to fully take ownership of their own successes and failures and reach their full growth potential until and unless they establish basic, dependable, and comprehensive infrastructure. A coordinated U.S. strategy to improve access to modern electricity will boost African economic growth and security. It will also increase U.S. investment in a rapidly growing continent. And I am proud to be one of the many co-sponsors of this act and really just want to end by saying that this is an action which is not only in the best interests of the countries on the continent, but also in the best interests of the national security interests of our country and the long-term economic well-being of this country. And I urge my colleagues to support its passage. And with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Cicilline. We uh, go now to Mr. Meadows uh, thank you, Mr. North Chairman. Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your leadership as, as well as Ranking Member Engel. Uh, I have had the opportunity to work with uh, Ms. Bass on this particular issue as well, and so uh, my uh, hat's off to so many. In an environment where fiscal, as my good friend from Alabama, uh, he and I both share our concerns over the fiscal uh, responsibility of, of our, our government. Uh, I would like to point out and associate my remarks with my good friend from Florida, Mr. Yoho. This is one of the few things, one of the few agencies within the federal government that actually OPEC, uh, that actually provides a return. And if you look at some of the most difficult times in terms of foreign governments, either in North Africa or the Middle East, uh, in terms of uh, having a, a difficult time with the political stability, even in spite of that environment since 2009, uh, OPEC has returned over $800 million to the General Treasury. And so if in the most difficult of times they can provide a positive return, uh, I think that we, uh, it, it's the kind of risk as a small business owner that I would love to have that model to continue to work providing a return to the General Treasury. And as we start to work these uh, things together, I have met with ambassadors from all over Africa, and their big concern, quite frankly, is, is that America is not playing and not investing in African countries like China is. And if we are going to compete, we un need to unleash the private sector to allow them to invest in these countries in a real and full way, embrace the kind of relationship that we have with many of our friends in Africa. And so I wholeheartedly support this and appreciate the work of so many in leadership that have uh, moved this bill forward. And you can count on my support. I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Uh, any, any other members seeking recognition? If, uh, if not, are there any amendments to the base text? Uh, Mr. Meadows, uh, do you have an amendment at the desk? Uh, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have an amendment at the desk. Then I will uh, ask the clerk to read that amendment. Amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute to H.R. 2548 offered by Mr. Meadows of North Carolina. Page 17, after line 2, insert the following. C. Annual Consumer Satisfaction Survey and Report. 1. Survey A. In general, for each of calendar years 2014 through 2016, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation shall conduct a survey of private entities that sponsor or are involved in projects that are insured, reinsured, guaranteed, or financed by the corporation regarding the level of satisfaction of such entities with the operations and procedures of the corporation with respect to such projects. Mr. The Chairman, could I move that the, this amendment be uh, uh, considered read? Without objection. Uh, the, re the Chair reserves a point of order and recognizes the author to briefly explain his amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a, a very simple amendment that really becomes a, a tool to hopefully uh, allow the Overseas Private Investment Corporation to conduct annual s surveys to report back uh, to uh, this committee and other appropriate committees within Congress in terms of uh, the level of satisfaction, potential problems uh, or potential improvements that might be suggested either that, that they have taken uh, or that we might consider legislatively to uh, improve uh, the 
really the focus on small businesses. It only pertains to those uh, small businesses or businesses that are sponsored with projects uh, that cost less than $20 million. It, uh, it be, just provides an issue where we can start to evaluate uh, the effectiveness of this program and be a more effective body here in terms of addressing the needs and making it streamlined uh, in terms of uh, the return that I previously spoke about, hopefully making that one that we can count on on a regular basis going forward. Uh, and, and with that, would be open to any answering any questions. Do uh, any members uh, seek recognition to speak on the amendment? Uh, yes, Mr. Mr. Grayson of Florida. Thanks. Uh, if I understand this amendment properly, what it is is it's depicting as a consumer satisfaction survey a survey of entities who benefit from OPEC, uh, as it's used in the term here in the amendment, private entities that sponsor or are involved in projects with OPEC. I'm not sure that's a good idea. Um, I don't think that resembles people's co conventional view of what a consumer satisfaction survey is. Also, I'm concerned about the potential cost of this. Uh, OPEC operates at a profit. Uh, in part because it is not tied down by what amounts to an unfan unf unfunded mandate like this one. Uh, I haven't heard any discussion yet of what this would cost. If we uh, load down OPEC with unfunded mandates, then presumably OPEC will stop being profitable. Um, I have some points of order that I'd like to raise, Mr. Chairman. Uh, should I raise them now during this time or wait until debate is over? Um, I, I think now might be the time uh, Mr. Grayson, that you would want to raise the, any point of order you might have? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I am concerned about the germaneness uh, of this amendment, uh, both with regard to Rule 5b3 and in general. Uh, I note that this amendment uh, doesn't contain the word Africa nor the word electricity in it. Um, it may be a good idea on its own. I tend to think not, but this seems to me to be something that is properly presented to the committee as a standalone bill. Uh, and is not germane to an Electrify Africa bill. Uh, uh, if, I, if I could respond to that point at this, at this moment, Mr. Grayson. Yes. Um, in, in my consultation here with the parliamentarian, he tells me that because of the subjects in Section 8 of the base text, uh, this amendment is germane. The rationale is this. Um, the subject in, base, in the base text speaks to the issue of OPEC as a, as a whole in sections of that, uh, of, of that language, um, not exclusively to electrification or African electrification. So um, uh, it, it would be germane under that, under that uh, reading. Well, Mr. Chairman, I would also like to raise a point of order concerning uh, the, this being a second order amendment. Uh, we are now looking at an amendment to the amendment in the nature of a substitute. Uh, does the committee entertain second, third, and fourth order amendments? Let, let me give you again the parliamentarian's view on this. The Meadows Amendment is subject to, to second degree amendment because the amendment in, a, in the nature of a substitute is based text rather than an amendment. Can the chairman clarify that further for future reference? The, the um, the ANS is base text uh, as though uh, it was the introduced text of the bill itself. So it is not, uh, so it is not an amendment. Mr. And Mr. I, Chairman. I, I think that is, that is usually the way an amendment in the nature of substitute is, once it's, once it's accepted, is treated. Mr. Chairman, that raises an interesting general point, and I am asking now not just for this context but for future reference. Does that mean that amendment in the nature of the substitute is counted as base text whether or not it meets the 48-hour notice rule? It, it. It, it did meet the 48-hour If it had not met rule. the 48-hour notice rule, would that still be the case? We would not, under committee rules, in that situation, put it as base text. We would have to consider it instead as an amendment. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That is very helpful and will be interesting uh, in future contexts. Um, I would also like to raise a point of order concerning the Committee's jurisdiction. 
uh, over this particular amendment, um, both with regard to the fact that it applies to OPEC as a standalone and that it seems to involve the expenditure of appropriated funds. Well, yes. According to the House parliamentarian, OPEC is the is is within clearly the jurisdiction of this committee. We we have authority oversight over OPEC and uh, jurisdiction over OPEC. So the amendment would be in order. All right. Uh, thank you for those rulings. I will continue to object to this amendment on the basis that it amounts to uh, an unfunded mandate against OPEC and should have properly been brought as a standalone bill uh, for the Committee's uh, perusal and not as a last-minute amendment. Thank you. I yield back. I, th I thank the gentleman uh, for yielding. Uh, do other members wish to seek uh, recognition to speak on this amendment? Um, the, the chair withdraws uh, the point of order. And uh, I, I would point out, to just recognize myself for a minute, uh, OPEC is already doing much of what is requested, I think, in this amendment. Um, and I wonder, uh, Returning to the author of the amendment, uh, Mr. Meadows, uh, would you like to uh, respond? You know, I, I enjoy a, a good relationship uh, and, and wholeheartedly support the efforts of OPEC and have worked uh, with them both privately and certainly in encouraging other members uh, to support not only their efforts but the efforts uh, in general to uh, promote overseas private investment. This particular uh, function becomes something that uh, uh, would make this uh, a function of an obligatory requirement to uh, report annually to Congress on efforts that they are taking, something that, quite frankly, under the current leadership that they are doing uh, now. Uh, however, uh, with change of administration and, and uh, the potential change in leadership within that uh, particular corporation, uh, that could change. And so uh, this promotes uh, an activity that I think that we are enjoying now and more codifies it and makes it uh, official. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, and to recognize myself for my remaining time, um, upon some reflection, I think the um, I think the survey, arguably, uh, would then require OPIC to provide some information here that might be pretty useful that could help improve their operation and their relevance to small business. And, of course, at the end of the day, small business remains the largest employer in the United States. So from that standpoint, this, uh, this information could be useful, and I am told that they do surveys uh, currently. So uh, my presumption is that this would fit within the framework of what they are currently doing without tremendous additional cost, but probably with the added benefit of uh, being useful to small business in the United States. And from that standpoint, I am um, prepared to support the amendment and appreciate the gentleman's effort. But if there is no further request for recognition, the question will occur on uh, Mr. Meadows' amendment. All of those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed say no. Uh, in the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it, and the amendment is agreed to. And um, we will go now to a recorded vote. And uh, let, me, let me also Without objection, H.R. 2548 is amended. As amended. Hearing no further amendments to this measure, the question occurs on agreeing to H.R. 5548 as amended. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The bill is amended, is agreed to. Without objection, H.R. 5548 is ordered favorably reported. 2548 is, is ordered favorably reported. 
It will be reported as a single amendment in the nature of a substitute. Staff is directed to make any technical and conforming changes. And um, that concludes business for today. I want to thank uh, Ranking Member Engel um, and all of our committee members for their contributions and assistance to today's markup. And uh, in addition, I would like to thank uh, Nelmany Rubin. I would like to thank our other staff members here, uh, Warku Gachow and uh, Jackie Quinotis, for their support on this legislation. Thank you very much. We stand adjourned.